Oh, you guys are freezing too? Yeah, we're going going to Have you gone outside yet? Yes, oh, yeah. we did. Okay. We want to move the slides outside. Yeah. <laughs> Stop brightening up. <laughs> Wasting a lot of energy <laughs> turning this into the Arctic. Yeah. I don't know why they're doing that. What's going on? Yeah. We said this when we walked in. I don't know it felt like you're walking man. straight into the, the face of the glacier. So, you know, if it was 100 degrees outside, we would be yeah. loving this. No, we wouldn't. No. 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 It's still a little too cold. <laughs> it must be 50 degrees in here. <laughs> oh, you, yes, we can check, couldn't we? Uh, Actually, well, my the phone goes out. And gets Stuart Fidel says whatever it's cold. Right, so yes, and, it'll uh, still be out there. He was the uh, primary investigator in the pipeline oh, yeah? for the Tennessee yeah. Pipe Company. So I, of course, I was in the yeah, whole two hours drive. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I got yeah. to yeah. hunt him down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here he is now. What? Where are you going? People in here. Um, Stoverbot. Okay. Oh. All right. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna move them along. Yeah. So I started this morning in Bellingham,
talk about in mid-talk. Um, early Paleowinians apparently harvested waterfowl and they often camp near lakes and wetlands. But did they arrive in New England early enough to visit the shores of the huge glacial lakes? So let's begin with a review of the latest data on the retreat of the Laurentide Ice Sheet and the formation and drainage of Glacial Lake Hitchcock. Um, those are our um, calendar ages. I don't know if you can make them out. Um, New England was under a one to two mile thick ice sheet during the last Wisconsin glaciation. And the ice reaches its maximum extent about 28,000 calendar years ago when it extended to Long Island and northern Pennsylvania. The ice then began to melt and retreat about 23,700 calendar years ago. Um, the front was at the Connecticut-Massachusetts border about 18,000 calendar years ago, uh, at the uh, Massachusetts-Vermont border about 15,500, and at the Vermont-Canada border about 13,400. And uh, every year, as uh, has already been discussed, but maybe not at, at sufficient uh, length, uh, the lake was laying, was laying down uh, bars. As, so there's a, a thin and a, a thick part of the bar, of the bar uh, that's winter and summer deposition. So it's annual. And you, you can actually count the bars um, to get a chronology of um, uh, glacial melting. And um, this was first done back in the 20s by the Danish geologist uh, Ernst Antes. And um, he came over and, and worked in New England and also worked in uh, the American Southwest. And uh, from the little I've, I've read about Antep, I think he was something of a genius, actually. Um, he got the date of Clovis right. And this is the thing that really um, uh, amazed me when I read about it. Uh, radiocarbon dates started to come out in the uh, mid to late 50s on, on Paleo-Winian sites in the southwest, and they were coming out about 11,000 years ago. And Antep said, no, there's something wrong here. It should be 13,000 years. And uh, 70 years later, well, the, the, no, let's make that 40 years later, um, that's what turned out to be the case. The calendar age is not the same as the radiocarbon age, as, as we heard earlier. So Antep was right. Um, and he was apparently right about the bars in New England, too, but that sequence was uh, basically ignored because of some initial um, uh, questioning until, um, oh, I guess about um, 20 years ago, uh, when John Ridge uh, at Tufts uh, revived interest in, in VARB dating. And now we have a, a, an excellent sequence that um, has been published in the last uh, two decades. Um, so according to the new VARF chronology, um, the ice front was at Hatfield about 16,100 calendar years ago, or 47 to 4,800 VARF years. And this is, uh, we've seen this one before, this is sort of what it would have looked like with the ice front not far away and the lake out in front of it. Now the, the VARF chronology can be connected to uh, the larger global time frame by radiocarbon dating little bits of organic material such as twigs that were incorporated into the lake sediments. Uh, but then those dates also have to be calibrated because the radiocarbon content of the atmosphere has not always been the same. Um, so as uh, was illustrated uh, just a moment ago, 11,000 years is equivalent to about 13,000 calendar years. Uh, and um, 12,300 radiocarbon years is about 14,500 uh, real calendar years. Oops. 
Uh, it's uh, interesting to note that variations in bar thickness in the northern section of Lake Hitchcock appear to correlate in time with climate change events that are seen in the annual layers of Greenland ice sheet, uh, which has uh, been cored by a couple of projects, the, the GRIP, the North GRIP, and the uh, GIST to uh, ice core project. So, the, as I said, the ice front is at Hatfield, about 16,100 calendar years. It's 4,700, 4,800 VARB years. The ice front is at Deerfield, around 15,900 calendar, or 4,893 VARB years. Uh, there's a little confusion. You, you can check out, Ridge has a, a web page uh, with uh, a lot of information about the VARB project, um, but there was a New England VAR sequence and an American VAR sequence, and they've made some adjustments so the the two sets are off by a couple hundred years. Um, I, I hope I'm interpreting uh, the current sequence correctly. Um, the oldest uh, late VARs that were deposited on bedrock at, at the uh, Amherst campus of UMass date to uh, about 15,600 calendar years. The youngest bars in uh, the core at UMass uh, date to 14,200 plus or minus 500 calendar years. And that's based on work by uh, Goebel and, and Ridnour in uh, 2006. Um, they got a radiocarbon date of 12,370 plus or minus 120, and that's bar years uh, 5776 to 5783. Right? This is really interesting work. Um, apparently there were fish in Lake Hitchcock. Um, uh, so some, some fish tracks have actually been seen in bars and dated. And uh, see where RR is on the, the map? Uh, that's uh, about where Sugarloaf is. And uh, these were uh, bars from, uh, from Sugarloaf with these uh, tracks created by the fins on the fish bottom. And uh, uh, they're mostly thought to be made by uh, Arctic char. Um, and these uh, Sugarloaf tracks date to uh, about 15,500 calories. Okay, the, there's a difference between the history of the southern part of the lake and the northern part. Um, and uh, it seems that it's quite different north of, of Claremont, New Hampshire. Uh, up there, some kind of lake, um, not necessarily fully glacial, but maybe fed by side streams after the glacial meltwater was not primary anymore. Um, but there's a lake till 12,200 calendar years. Uh, there's evidence of a dramatic drop um, sometime between 13,280 and 12,290 uh, by about 60 meters, and a major outflow is dated to 13,165 calendar years. Um, and that's interesting in, in two respects. One is that's just when Paleo-Indians are starting to spread all over North America with fluted points. Uh, it's also um, about when a cold spell that preceded the Younger Dryas, it's called the intra cold period, began. And uh, the latter is attributed um, probably to uh, a, a great torrent of meltwater from Glacial Lake Iroquois going down the Hudson Valley into the ocean and disrupting the thermal uh, circulation of the North Atlantic. So um, that's the northern part. What about um, the southern section of the lake? Um, so 2006, Goebel and Rittenauer uh, obtained 
optically simulated luminescence or OSL days for sand grains and dunes um, near uh, UMass. Some of these dunes are on the old lake bottom, others are on the raised deltas where, as we've heard several times, um, there were side streams emptying into the lake. Now, OSL is not as precise as, as radiocarbon. Um, there are various uncertainties and large standard errors that are attached to OSL dates. But take them for what they're worth. Um, at Hadley, the dunes on the lake bottom date to 12,100 plus or minus 1,100. These are all calendar ages. Uh, 11,600 plus or minus 700, 10,800 plus or minus 800. Uh, in Montague, a dune on a terrace cut into the delta dates to 13,300 plus or minus 800. In South Hadley, a dune on the Chicopee delta dates to 12,400 plus or minus 900. So um, evidently, the bottom of Lake Hitchcock was completely dry and exposed to winds or blowing the sand around by about 13,000 to 12,500 calendar years, give or take. Um, this raises an, an obvious question. What was the situation between about 14,000 when the last dated bars um, have been uh, timed and 13,000? If there was still a lake in the valley, where are the bars that should have been laid down by the lake? And I don't have an answer to that. And I haven't found one in the literature. So if there was still a big lake or maybe a mosaic of small lakes and marshes uh, remaining in, in the flat, uh, would Paleo-Indians have been attracted to that environment? Were they interested in lakeshore resources? And there's been a lot of theorizing over the past decade about uh, coastal adaptation and migration of Paleo-Indians, some of it uh, inspired by the need to get early migrants around the ice sheet and down the Pacific coast to reach the supposed settlement at Monte Verde in southern Chile by about 14,300 uh, years ago, um, or by the bizarre Salutrian origin theory that uh, Mike was talking about earlier that would require a transatlantic voyage about 24,000 calendar years ago. Um, but Setting aside these coastal migration and adaptation ideas, we do have clear evidence that the ancestral Paleo-Indians in central Alaska, which was then the eastern portion of Beringia, settled near lakes and harvested uh, lots of waterfowl, um, swans and geese and ducks. Um, the Broken Mammoth site, which is one of the oldest known, um, at 13,600 uh, years ago, 40% of their meat is estimated to have been derived from swans and geese and ducks. And the same is true of most of the sites uh, in the Tanana and Nanana drainages in central Alaska. Um, so the earliest people we know of, and let, let me underline for other reasons, um, that the earliest occupations in Alaska date to 14,300 years ago. And that's the way people had to get into the Americas from Northeast Asia, which we know on genetic grounds is where they came from. So anybody who's talking about occupation south of the ice sheets earlier than 14,300 years ago has to contend with the absence of any occupations in the homeland area. Um, this is also true of the coast uh, north of southern Chile. There are no sites in California or Oregon or Washington State that are um, uh, of sufficient age to, to be uh, ancestral to interior sites on the order of 15, 16,000 years or more. So I think that the Alaskan record puts a constraint uh, on the earliest possible age of, of the ancestors of Native Americans. Now, there might have been non-Native American people from who knows where, Africa, Europe, whatever, roaming around the Americas before that, but if they were, they didn't leave any genetic traces and hardly any archaeological traces that we can recognize. So, that aside, um, yeah, people were interested in waterfowl, and even going farther back, we now have genetic evidence 
um, that um, people who were living at Malta in southern Siberia contributed, well, they are part of a larger population called ancient North Eurasians that contributed about 40% of the genetic ancestry of Native Americans. Uh, and at that site of Malta, where it, the genome has been extracted recently from a 24,000-year-old kid uh, who had been buried there, they also were making these wonderful uh, art objects for, for uh, ornaments, um, including these flying swan pendants. So we know that um, there was both an economic and an aesthetic interest in waterfowl back in uh, southern Siberia uh, among the ancestors of Native Americans. The um, present-day flight paths of migratory tundra swans follow pretty much the Ice Free Corridor route uh, between Yukon and the central U.S. And based on some um, paleontological evidence from U uh, the Yukon, um, uh, they seem to have been flying over the ice even during the last glacial maximum, um, which, of course, is also the, the route long assumed to have been used by the first Native Americans. So maybe um, instead of um, mammoth or bison or, or uh, elk, um, their primary interest was in um, netting waterfowl along the road. This is a, a wonderful diorama at the New York State Museum showing Paleoindian life uh, near West Athens Hill. Um, but you'll notice in the distance, um, there's some geese or swans flying. Um, and uh, I wonder, you know, our hunter is evidently ready to go after some more caribou with his spear and his antler headdress for a disguise. But maybe he's telling the wife and kids either, hey, they're flying away, spring is coming, or hey, they'll be landing soon. Why don't you try to bag a few for dinner? Um, it, um, there, there has been survey work done on the Army base at Fort Drum up in, in northern New York um, under supervision of Lori Rush. And um, she observed that um, the usual models um, that people use for location of the prehistoric sites uh, didn't work all that well there. The most um, predictive factor is whether sites are located close to. Um, the old lake shore. This is a, a glacial lake, Iroquois. Um, but yeah, there, some of those dots are indeed Paleo-Indian um, locations. But actually, only three represent Paleo-Indian fluted point uh, find spots, and the rest are later. So there's something about that um, topographic feature that is continuing to draw. Uh, people to camp there um, for millennia after the lake is gone. And as I said earlier, Lake Iroquois drained about 13,100 calendar years ago. So uh, a point of that sort, um, which is a latish Paleoindian point, is not actually associated with the lake. It's just the old shoreline. Because the lake would have been gone by uh, 12,007, 12,600 years ago. And certainly it was gone by uh, you know, the time late archaic people are using the, the same locations. Um, maybe there's a scarp there, and so it's a good place to, to find fresh water coming out of the springs. Not sure what the uh, attractive factor is after the lake is gone. Uh, uh, Peter Thomas mentioned um, the Champlain Sea earlier. And the Champlain Sea formed sometime around um, 13,200 or so. Um, remember, the ice had only uh, hit the, the uh, Vermont-Canada border about 13,400. And then as it pulls back, there's depression. The seawater comes in. Sea mammals and other fauna come in. Um, uh, Jess Robinson, who's now the state archaeologist in Vermont, has been really interested in this. And um, these uh, maps show locations of 
uh, sort of middle and late Paleo-Indian sites uh, near the shoreline of the, the Champlain Sea. In this case, there would still have been a Champlain Sea down to, I, I would guess, about 12,000, maybe, maybe later. So those might actually be associated in some way with the use of the shoreline. But uh, the fluted points, um, those Michelle uh, Ponce uh, points are of uh, a quite late style. And keep that in mind because we'll be seeing some more in the next couple of slides. Um, this is from a recent article uh, by uh, Boulanger and, and Wyman where they uh, were trying to show that there's hardly any overlap in time of the earliest Paleo-Indian sites and the last megafaunal sites in the Northeast. Um, I actually think that the mapping sort of made the reverse point that they do just barely overlap, which is the case pretty much across the Americas. People show up, megafauna die off in a couple of centuries. Um, but uh, something that is maybe worth noting here, um, so the, the yellowish dots are megafauna, the white ones are, are pale, dated Paleo-Indian location. These were uh, points underwater, uh, out of the waters off Boston. Um, so they were out on a continental shelf, and both of these were dated and there were about 11,000 radiocarbon or 13,000 calendar years. Um, and uh, that's the ivory pond where uh, we're hoping that more work is going to go on. Um, and that was dated very approximately with uh, uh, not terribly precise radiocarbon dates as, as about 11,500 radiocarbon years. Okay, so that, yeah, this is uh, Ivory Pond. These are the, uh, there's a mammoth and a mastodon from out in the water here. And um, I, I just read recently that the mammoth was a dwarf, which is kind of fascinating. Um, anyway, the, the point of this being that you know, there's the Hudson. Um, there is a growing assumption among Paleo-Indian uh, specialists that um, Clovis, per se, is not found east of the Hudson. Um, but megafauna were able to cross, um, and they're all the way over here at 11,000 radiocarbon. Uh, I don't see why we shouldn't anticipate uh, Paleo-Indians here. Um, close to 13,000. Um, this is the, uh, the latest calibration of radiocarbon dates, um, just published. Uh, what they've managed to do, radiocarbon is calibrated using tree rings. There are northern hemisphere tree rings and, and there's a new set being studied in the Southern Hemisphere from New Zealand, and they've managed to link up the sequences of Northern rings and Southern rings. Um, and what's really important here, okay, um, that's where the uh, Sugarloaf date Falls. And notice there's a plateau. Um, this has to do with vagaries in the way uh, radio radioactive carbon uh, leaves the ocean, enters the ocean, the interaction with the atmosphere maybe has something to do even with uh, um, solar effects. In any case, um, the, the real age could be anywhere from here to here. So. Like 12.1 to 12.5 or so. Just before that, there's a radical uh, drop off in, in radiocarbon. So, within a, a, about a 70 year uh, real time frame, radiocarbon dates dropped from almost 11,000 down to 
10,550. Um, so in a sense, it's good. That means any data, 107, 108, 10,650, they're all here. And, and you can quite precisely date them in real time. But then you have a problem here and a problem here, um, which actually is more visible, I think, in, in this version. Um, so um, if we're talking about 12,900, 12,800, 12,750, um, all of those could produce a date of 11,000 or a Clovis date. So we're never going to do better for early Clovis than about a 200, 250 year time frame. Even though the dates are reported these days like plus or minus 25. Uh, this comes from a pretty recent publication by John Walker et al., um, where they were trying to uh, uh, sort sites in the Northeast based on style primarily. Um, and you see here that uh, Dedek or Sugarloaf is considered a, an earlyish site with a 12.9 to 12.7 date. Well, that doesn't fit with the one good radiocarbonators that Mike's gotten on calcine bone there. So maybe style isn't that uh, good a criterion for creating a, a series. Okay, so uh, the new point that Jason found, the veil uh, point and uh, a sugar loaf point. And uh, now I just have a series of uh, comparisons. Uh, these are fluted points from West Athens Hill, West Athens Hill near the, the church source in uh, the Hudson Valley. Um, and um, those are assumed to be early. Um, maybe they're not all early, but uh, my, my friend Julie Morrow assures me, having recently looked at the whole assemblage, that there is real Clovis uh, in, in that assemblage. Um, okay, so there's the, the sugar loaf point in the middle, Bullbrook material on the right. Um, Shawnee Minnesink is on the upper Delaware in Northeast Pennsylvania, um, and that has uh, numerous radiocarbon dates on seeds from a single uh, fireplace, so we know that they're uh, very precise and they all date in one episode, and uh, that is actually probably the best dated Clovis site in, in North America. And um, according to the new calibration, it would be about 12,800 calendar years. Now that's the suggested stylistic series, um, and just based on a, an eyeball uh, comparison, uh, it looks like um, uh, Sugarloaf would be maybe toward the early range of the Bullbrook um, part of the sequence. We know based on its actual radiocarbon association that the, Sh the Shawnee Minnesink point is at the early end. Um, and it looks to me like the Vale uh, point is in the maybe Kings Road Whipple part of the scale. Um, a second fluted point has been found at Shawnee Minnesink. Uh, most of the Formal tools there are actually end scrapers. Uh, but the, that smaller point at the left is a, a, a new find from several years ago in new excavations at, at Shawnee Menacing. And to the right, those are all um, Clovis points of the classic type found with the Naco uh, mammoth in, in southern Arizona. And um, 
I, I think Jason Fine really looks like these Western Clovis points, particularly uh, the one in the sort of second. Um, But just notice how much variation there is in a single component. I mean, those, those are all spears that were put into that mammoth by members of the same band in one episode. And look how much stylistic variation there is. <laughs> now my friend Julie uh, is, is uh, quite definite that there are um, unmistakable differences in the Midwest between classic early Clovis and uh, Ganey, which she thinks is a couple hundred years later. And um, those differences involve um, uh, how many times during production uh, the fluting was done, um, and uh, the angle of uh, the, uh, the basal platform and uh, how deeply concave the bases are. Obviously, Clovis bases tend to be less concave. Um, so, um, is, is the Northampton point Clovis or is it Ganey? Again, I think the, the veil point is, is clearly more of a gaining point. But uh, to, to my eyes, the Northampton find looks more Clovis. And just to, to conclude, I, I found this from a 1954 um, a bulletin of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. And um, Can, can you move it to the last slide? Uh, Ganey, by the way, without any good radiocarbon associations, is assumed to date about 12,900 to 12,600. Um, okay, so just working? Maybe, maybe not. No. Let's see if you actually shut it off. Should be green light. There is a green light. Hello. There you oh, go. There we go. Um, this one is uh, from. Uh, you have to put it close to you. Okay. This is from Deerfield, somewhere. And it sure looks Clovis to me. Um, this is from uh, Rhode Island. Um, I think that's Clovis. The rest of these, I think, are, are probably um, Bullbrook, Ganey. Um, frankly, this, if you found it, um, in New Mexico, you'd say it was a Folsom point, even with the little uh, nipple over there. Uh, that, that also looks very Folsom-like to me. Um, so uh, I guess uh, the question would be if, if uh, there is real Clovis in, in this uh, part of the Connecticut Valley, could the first uh, people into the area have seen the last remnants of, of Lake Hitchcock? And I think the answer might be yes. So leave it at that.